Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sparks Talks webinar series, part of the Light the Spark initiative by uh, Girls Action Foundation. Um, I am Elvira Trulia, the communications manager and web producer for Girls Action, and in a couple of minutes, I will be introducing today's presenter, Jennifer Lord, who will be talking about Canada's murdered and missing Aboriginal women and girls. In particular, Jennifer will highlight some violence prevention strategies and some specific actions to commemorate the murdered and missing including a call for national inquiry. So if you've already participated um, in a Girls Action webinar, welcome back. Uh, for those attending for the first time, thanks uh, so much for joining us to find out about this important topic. And before giving the floor to Jennifer, I wanted to briefly introduce you or to reintroduce you to uh, Girls Action Foundation. Um, so very quickly, Girls Action Foundation is a, a national nonprofit that works to empower girls. We're based in Montreal where we run local girls clubs and we work with some 300 partners who run local girls programs in communities uh, across Canada. We organize activities like leadership training programs, networking events, and various other projects uh, for girls, young women, and those who, who do girls-specific programming. In terms of impact, nationally we reach some 60,000 girls and young women and located in northern, rural, and urban communities across the country. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this, is, um, this webinar is presented as part of uh, the Sparks Talks webinar series, Light a Spark, as a, a national campaign that, um, that engaged um, women role models across Canada. And certainly uh, we, uh, we have the great pleasure to invite Jennifer Lord and uh, the Native Women Association of Canada to participate in this series uh, for their important work in, in really giving voice to Native women in Canada. So just a couple more things uh, before inviting uh, Jennifer to, to join um, in the conversation. I wanted to, to introduce you to the, or to go over the agenda, as you see on your screens. So after this introduction, I'll give the floor to Jennifer. But as part of the introduction, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to go over the process and to talk um, to give you an orientation to the webinar platform and talk, um, give you some tech pointers. So you'll see on uh, your screen a number of slides, the, and these will be changing throughout the presentation. There's also a series of inf information panels on the right-hand side of your screen, and each panel um, has its own icon uh, located in the menu tab on the top right-hand side. So if you look to the right at this point, um, you should see a chat panel, and that should already be open on your screen. So please use this chat panel to communicate with me if you have any tech issues during the presentation. I'll be looking at it throughout, um, throughout the next hour, and I'll do my best to help you troubleshoot if you do have any tech issues. So to send me a message, just please select my name from the drop-down menu and, um, and press send and I will respond to you as quick, quickly as I can. Um, you'll also see the, a Q&A panel on the right-hand side. That's the one with the, um, the question mark icon, and that should also be visible. So please use this panel to send me your questions um, about the presentation. So as soon as Jennifer finishes her presentation, we're going to open up the Q&A session, and I'm going to be moderating that session. Uh, what I'm going to do is pass on your questions um, to Jennifer um, during that session. But feel free to, to, as soon as you think of a question, to send it directly into that Q&A panel. And lastly, I wanted to point out that today's webinar is being recorded, um, including the question period, and all of this will be available as a podcast. It will be available online in the next couple of weeks, and I will be sending um, in the email message to everyone uh, with a link to the recording. So with that, um, all the nuts and bolts out of the way, I'm, I'm happy now to introduce Jennifer. Um, so Jennifer Lord has been working with the, the Native Women's Association of Canada since 2004. Currently, she is the Strategic Policy Liaison and does public public education, sorry, uh, to raise awareness about the alarming rates of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls in Canada. Jennifer believes it is incredibly important for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities to work together and understand that this is an issue that affects every Canadian. Jennifer is a Métis woman originally from Edmonton, Alberta, and she describes herself as a proud wife, mother, and Indigenous feminist. With that, welcome, Jennifer to um, to the webinar. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad that uh, you were able to join us today over this lunch hour. First, I just want to thank Girls Action Foundation for inviting me to come today and participate in this webinar. It's always nice to have someone else host them and uh, do all the technical work, so thank you very much for all of that. Um, I've already been introduced, so that's great. What I will do is, uh, this is just a picture of me, so that's, you know, and now we've all met formally. Um, I am Métis. My home community is Lac St. Anne, which is just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. And I live here and work here in Ottawa with my with my family, my husband and my two girls. And I'm proud to say that uh, I'm a grassroots woman, an Indigenous feminist, and I also work for a national Aboriginal organization. So that's the Native Women's Association of Canada. The Native Women's Association of Canada, or the acronym we say NWAC, works to advance the well-being of Aboriginal women and girls, as well as their families and communities through activism, policy analysis, and advocacy. We're an aggregate of 12 Aboriginal women's groups from coast to coast to coast. Some people call those PTOs or PTMAs. We call them sister organizations. And we have one in every province and territory except for Nunavut. And we were incorporated in 1974. We're one of the five officially recognized national Aboriginal organizations in Canada. And our purpose really is to represent and speak at the national level on behalf of Aboriginal women in Canada. NWAC. First, can I interrupt you for just a second, just to, to mention now that uh, you've introduced yourself. Maybe it would be nice for, for people to introduce um, each other or themselves as well uh, by answering the polling questions that you should uh, see on your screen at this point. So. Um, please take a couple of minutes to, to answer those polling questions. It'll be a, a good way to, for Jennifer to gauge who's in the room and, and why you're participating in today's webinar. And just please take a couple of minutes to, um, to answer those questions on, that should appear on your screen. Excellent. I just answered them all as well. <laughs> That's great. Um, so definitely answer the polling questions too. It's good for, for, for me especially to know number three, how familiar are you with this issue of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls in Canada? And just to continue, so NWAC is the only national Aboriginal organization with an entire department working directly to address this issue of extreme violence experienced by Aboriginal women and girls. That doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of partners, allies, supporters, even some fabulous champions in the country, but sadly we're the only organization that has an entire department. So usually it's a file and it's a file that one person shares amongst many files. So we began this work with the Sisters in Spirit initiative, and that was from 2005 to 2010. And now we continue this work through another project called Evidence to Action. And our department is called Violence Prevention and Safety. Why do we do this work? Well, one of the reasons why we do this work is because this, this type of violence has impacted our communities and people in many ways. And we all suffer directly and indirectly, and sadly, none of us are immune. And really, we feel as NWAC, as women, and as life givers, we have a great responsibility to ensure the well-being and safety of our mothers, daughters, sisters, aunties, and grandmothers. But first and foremost, we want to make sure that it's Indigenous women, First Nation, Métis, Inuit women, Aboriginal women. This is our story and our lives, and we need to be at the forefront of talking about this issue always. What does our department do? Um, this is just a basic in introduction. We have several main activities, but I wanted to introduce you to five of them. I will go through them quickly. If anyone wants to go back to anything, for example, the first one I talk about is the Community Resource Guide or the CRG, just put the question in the Q&A and I can go back and expand on any one of these things, no problem. The Community Resource Guide, this is what it looks like. It's a CD, it's available for free download. It's a plain language resource, there's a training video. Chapter one is dedicated to advocates and campaigners. Chapter two is for people assisting families. And chapter three is teachers and educators. Inside this, as you see, it's called Community Resource Guide. What can I do to help the families of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls? It's really for anyone who wants to learn about this issue because there are fact sheets in Chapter 3. More importantly, once you're aware and educated on the issue, it has great resources on how you can move this issue forward and do good in Canadian society in general on this, as well as how to engage First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities on this issue as well. It's available for free download at the NWAC website, which is nwac.ca. 
some of the mo most popular topics include getting involved in your community. So that's really about proper engagement if you're non-Aboriginal. And I'm available always. Uh, you can call the office at NWAC here in Ottawa and talk to me, and I can give you some pointers on that. There's Sisters in Spirit Vigils, which are a movement for social change. There's a great toolkit on navigating victim services, and there are several fact sheets, and the most popular one we have for download right now is the fact sheet on missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. That's a good four-pager that you can download. You can put it in your school report. You can bring it to your workplace, and it's just a great, uh, easy way to access these fact sheets. And again, uh, go to our website, nlac.ca, and you can uh, download our community resource guide. Our second activity is the NWAC petition for a national inquiry. This has been circulating for a little bit over a year. Um, to give you a basic introduction to it, it's a, it's a petition calling for a national public inquiry into the issue of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. There's a picture here, which is a sample of what one would look like. We have that also on our website at nwac.ca for free download. We don't have a digital, uh, an online version. It's something like change.org. And one of the reasons why we have that is because when we're trying to present these petitions to the federal government, they need to be in a certain format, and they need to be actually handwritten copies because you require a signature, which something like change.org doesn't have. So that's why we need actual hard copies. Um, again, you can get it on the NWAC website. Just look for a petition if you're searching in the box for that. And we need completed petitions returned to us before October 18th because that day is the National Day of Action and Remembrance. And we'll be presenting all the petitions on the Hill and calling for action on that day. One of the big things that we also do here is the knowledge transfer. And what we're trying to do is like part of participating in this webinar here with Girls Action Foundation is to talk about this issue of extreme violence of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls really as an outcome or as indicative of a broader social problem and the way that I explain it. Jennifer, can I just interrupt for a second? Because um, actually one of our attendees um, was asking if it was possible to maybe just slow down a little bit. <laughs> Do that. And, and um, so if, if you wouldn't mind doing that. And also just take a step back to explain a little bit more about the National Inquiry. So for people that are not familiar, so they have a better idea of what that might be. Sure. So I can go back here. So hopefully everyone can see it. The National Inquiry, I'm sorry that I'm a very, very fast talker. I just I want to pack it all in. It's a very intense, intense webinar. Um, the National Inquiry, really, the reason why we're calling for such a national and public inquiry is because when we're talking about before, when I'm talking about the devaluing of Aboriginal women and girls, we're talking about um, a societal change. And we feel as an organization that having a national public inquiry will participate in adding value back to First Nation, Métis, Inuit women and girls, and making this a public issue, a Canadian issue. Because more often than not, we think about this type of violence as a women's issue, or maybe even a native problem. And really, this is a Canadian tragedy, a human rights issue here in Canada, one of the most prevalent. And that's why we're looking for a national public inquiry to make this very public, to have actual Canadian dollars put towards it, and have our politicians from all levels of government really address this issue in, in, the, in the full way that it needs to be addressed and make it public so that all Canadians can become aware of it. The knowledge transfer, no problem. I talked about it before. It's a devaluing of Aboriginal women and girls. So what we're talking about is racialized, sexualized violence. And what that means is we're talking about Aboriginal women who are targeted for sexual violence because of their gender and because of their Aboriginal identity. We're talking about societal ignorance, policing indifference, legislative policies. I can go back to a lot of those things later on if people want that in the uh, Q&A section. Also, you can find great information on this in the three fact sheets that I mentioned that are available in the Community Resource Guide. What do we know? In 2010, the Native Women's Association of Canada uh, issued a report, and the title is right there. It's called What Their Stories Tell Us, Re Research Findings from the Sisters and in Spirit Initiative. And what we know is that there are 582 known cases of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls in Canada. This is from our NWAC database. It's the first of its kind in Canada, and we hope there are more to come. The reason why NWAC had to put a database together to track occurrences of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls is because the RCMP and other major law enforcement 
organizations here in the country um, don't make it mandatory to ask for ethnicity of victims. So oftentimes we see incarceration rates are very low, uh, very high for certain ethnicities, especially First Nation, Métis, Inuit. That's because when you're charged with a crime in a little box after you've been fingerprinted, there's a box that says white or non-white, and officers are required to ask you to identify. We don't have that, unfortunately, for victims. And we've been lobbying for years and years to have that policy change so that officers are trained and feel comfortable asking someone what their identity is because we know that racialized, sexualized violence exists. We know that there are hate crimes in this country, and we need police officers, especially law enforcement, to be tracking it. But they don't, and that's why ANWAC started to do this work through our ANWAC database. We found, yeah, after five years of research, that this issue impacts all Aboriginal women, First Nation, Métis, Inuit women. Every province and territory is very much touched by this issue. So every province and territory, as you've seen, it is seen mostly as a Western problem. And as you look on the bottom of the graph for Alberta, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, they are higher numbers. But we know that this happens all across the country. And in many instances, cases are not reported, for example, in the north or in the east, but the violence occurs at the similar rates. They're just not reported in the media. Significantly more murder cases and missing cases. This was very shocking for us in our database of 582. 67% of the cases are murder cases. And nearly half of the murder cases remained unsolved. And this one was a very shocking one for us. And every time uh, I talk about this issue, my slides never change. It's the same information, really, to start a dialogue. Um, if we look at the Canadian clearance rate, and clearance rate just means that someone was charged with a crime. It doesn't mean that the, the charge actually stayed and it went to court and there was an appropriate crime against uh, violence for an Aboriginal compared to a non-Aboriginal woman. The clearance rate in Canada between 2000 and 2010 was 86%, but in our own research we found it was only 53%, so very disproportionate. And when we go and talk with law enforcement, we talk about our numbers and why that is happening and why a lot of the homicides are not cleared. Most importantly, we remember that a beautiful Aboriginal woman, woman is represented by every number shared and that each statistic tells a story. So it's very important whenever we're using the number 582 to acknowledge that NOAC knows there are many more cases out there. This is just the work that we were able to do in five years of research. We're con continuing to track occurrences. But from all this, we always want everyone to know that each statistic tells a story. If you're looking for more detailed information on any uh, particular family, we actually had 10 family members work with our research team and gifted us with life stories. And what life stories are, are more detailed information about a specific woman or girl or a mother and how she went missing or how she was murdered. But mostly it's a very positive shedding light on someone uh, from, their, from their birth up to their their disappearance or their loss, and from the family's perspective. They're very touching stories. And from the top left, you can see Amber with her mother, Gwenda, there. And then to the right, we have Beatrice and Gaylene. And down below, we have Danita and Debbie. We have Dolores, Georgina, Gladys, Lisa, and Nita. And they're all loved and missed terribly by their families. And there's a link down here where you can go and find these stories and read them. And they're also great for reading them in class or your place of worship or a book club, your workplace, doing that kind of work is a great way to connect people to this issue uh, right away, I think, and kind of putting the fact sheets out. The Faceless Doll Project is one of our newest projects, and we're really proud of it. It's a collection of faceless felt dolls that will be used to create a traveling art exhibit in memory of the more than 600 missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. And here's just a little sample of that picture. is. Uh, of uh, the faceless dolls. They're building on the uh, legacy of the Aboriginal Angel Doll Project, which was created in 2005. And what we were trying to do was really to, to bring a hands-on project when we travel across the country and give workshops similar to this kind of webinar. And we wanted to physically and visually create a representation of the 582 known cases. Each doll is hand cut by Gloria LaRock, who is my friend. She's a Cree artist. She's also from Alberta. 
There are little girl sizes and women's sizes. They're First Nation and Métis, and we're also working on an Inuit dress style. And really, they're a true reflection of Aboriginal women and girls because they have varying skin tones and, and hair colors. Myself, as a Métis woman, um, I'm quite light-skinned. I have blue eyes, and it's uh, often very difficult to find a true reflection of myself, even in in uh, textbooks and in children's books right now today that focus on Métis women, for example. Each doll in the collection is made by a workshop participant, so these could be family members, community members, service providers, teachers, advocates, youth, and no two dolls are the same, even though when we traveled for a year and a half, we provided the same information, and we allowed them to create no two dolls are the same. Now, we chose to make the dolls faceless to reflect society's devaluing of Aboriginal women and girls, because the media often portrays Aboriginal women as faceless, and Canadian society is at times indifferent to this tragedy, to the lives lost, and the humanity of the women. But we also feel there's great strength and unity with these faceless dolls, because each doll is unique, but their facelessness really unites them as part of the same community, and although no doll has a face together, their facelessness have a very powerful voice and a presence that can't be ignored. <coughs> So the first phase of the Inuit Faceless Doll Project was to travel the country and raise awareness and have participants make the dolls. And this is just some pictures of some of the workshops that we did across the country. This is Gloria LaRock here. I'm just going to move my cursor here. She's sitting up in the front right by the banner. So Gloria came to the very first workshop we did with about 75 Native Studies students in the Ottawa area. And these are just some quotes as I go through quickly of people who have been touched by this issue. This is actually my daughter, Olivia, on the bottom right. And this is a great project, especially to engage everyone in the community, especially young girls to talk about this issue. Of course, my language changes when there are young people in the audience, and I can help any of you who want to do similar presentations to learn how to change your language. But really, this project is about honoring Aboriginal women and really adding value to our perspectives and our images of First Nation Métis Indian women. This is just a great uh, quote that I had from a community member to say that it gave the, the project gave her a sense of pride and a little bit of relief. So that's wonderful. And this is another mother who had lost her sister for eight years now in Winnipeg. And when we went to Winnipeg, she came with her children to make dolls in honor of her missing sister and their missing aunt. These are just some other ones. And this is a post-secondary student that gave me this quote, telling me this is a Canadian issue, not just a Native or a women's issue, was the most powerful statement I've heard today. Keep saying it because not all of us focus so much on women or Native issues. Thank you. So I use this all the time, and I'm glad that she came and talked to me and submitted it as part of the feedback for the workshop. So all the $600 are now complete, and we're creating the NWAC Faces Doll Traveling Exhibit. And we received a little bit of funding from the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario to put this exhibit together, which we thank them for. And everyone wants to know what do 582 dolls look like. Well, here they are here. This is 11 panels. They were all completed and put on display for the first time this past National Aboriginal Day here in Ottawa. And there's a little girl here just looking at all of the dolls. It's a traveling exhibit. They all roll down, fold down very easily, so that's great. The second phase of the NLX Faceless Doll Project is to build on the legacy and have the dolls created in communities across the country. And we're very grateful and humbled that organizations and individuals continue to make faceless dolls in tribute and in solidarity. So these are just some examples of how other communities have uh, taken ownership of the Faceless Doll Project and made it something of their own. There's a little girl here from Wendake, Quebec, and they framed the dolls so everyone could take them home. And St. John's Native Friendship Center in Newfoundland, they made paper dolls. And they also decided to talk about violence as a whole. So they made boy and girl dolls, men and women dolls, and paper dolls as well. That's fantastic. Um, there's no, there are no restrictions on what you can and can't do with this project, which is one of the reasons why we put it out there for people to take ownership and talk about this issue in their own community in terms of what they want to do. This is another uh, grouping of dolls that we had family members actually have a missing and murdered loved one come together. And we told them about the project and what we're doing, and they made their own dolls. And I grouped them in a circle and gave everyone a picture of these dolls so they know that all their dolls are always traveling together as a family. 
a Catholic high school here in Ottawa also did a class where they brought me in to talk about this issue, and the dolls were framed and displayed in the school, and it was wonderful that they did this. These are just samples that I'm sharing with all of you of these different types of ideas and how it's kind of taken on a life of its own, which is what we want. We have uh, a few documents available to you for free download on our website. Again, it's NWAC, NWAC.ca. There's a document called Building on the Legacy of the NWAC Faith with Doll Project. It gives you all sorts of tips and uh, tools on how to put on your own Faith with Doll workshop. At the bottom, as you'll see, there are two templates, one for an Aboriginal woman shape, one for an Aboriginal girl template. We also have paper doll templates, which you print on thicker paper, and that was one that we did this past National Aboriginal Day. We couldn't give a lot of the children scissors to cut the felt, so what we asked them to do was decorate already images, and we have six different images of the dolls that are playing, and they decorated them and then took it home to, to talk about it. And several of the schools with the teachers, they displayed it on a large board in the classroom, which was fantastic. October 4th, Sisters and Spirit Vigils, which is a huge um, uh, endeavor for us. They're on October 4th. Today's October 1st. So I'm really glad I can talk to you all about the October 4th movement, and hopefully you can participate in your own way on Friday. And they're really a movement for social change. Every October 4th, Sisters and Spirit Vigils honor the lives of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. They support grieving families and provide opportunities for healing. And really, vigils can take many forms, a rally, a candlelight vigil, a community feast, or a moment of silence. And really, the most important thing about Sisters and Spirit Vigils is that we say united we can demand action on a Canadian issue that impacts us all. These are just some pictures of previous vigils. Events such as these have been going on since 2003 when ANWAC and family members held peaceful demonstrations on the Hill. We used to do them on February 14th, but the first October 4th vigil actually happened in 2006. And as you'll see, in 2006, when we first started this, we had 11 cities and we kept on growing and growing and growing. And we're actually very happy to say that last year we had 175 vigils on October 4th, 2012. And we actually just broke the 200 mark a few days ago, which we're very excited to see for October 4th, 2013. So these are vigils, communities, workplaces that are holding a moment of silence or a rally or a vigil, what have you, marking the day. And we have more than 200 registered, not only across the country, but across Turtle Island. We have some in the U.S. and we have several in the uh, international ones as well. Communities continue to plan vigils each year, demonstrating how the Sisters and Spirit vigils have transformed into a movement for social change, and we're very, very pleased and happy to see that. And we're pretty so you're, you're cutting out a little bit, uh, Jennifer. Oh, um, sorry. Do you want to retake that? Um, uh, I could just go back. I oh. started to cut out just, just your, the last slide, maybe. Yeah, so just communities continue to plan vigils each year, demonstrating how the Sisters and Spirit Vigils have transformed really into a movement for social change. And we're so happy to see some communities are hosting vigils for the very first time this year, but we also have some who have been celebrating them and holding them for eight years in a row, which is great. We're so grateful, first and foremost, to families and communities who are coming together. We have many sister organizations, as I shared. We have partners like Amnesty International and Kairos Canada, the National Association of Friendship Center, Canadian Federation of Students, and the labor movement has also been very, very supportive as well. A new feature that we had in 2011 that's still going strong today is a website called October 4th. It's October4th.ca, and there you can go and go to the virtual candlelight vigil and actually light a candle virtually on that website and leave a message of dedication for families and talking about this issue. And these are just some pictures here of all sorts of vigils that took place last year in 2012. As we said, it was a huge... Uh, Precedent setting year for us with more than 175 vigils nationwide and internationally, and this year we've broken our record already with more than 200. We have registration forms. It's not too late for any of you to register your vigil. The forms are in English and in French. You can register a moment of silence at your place of worship or at your workplace, and that would be fantastic just to keep on adding all this support. We also have Sisters and Spirit Vigil Kits. It's a little late for us to mail out the balloons and stickers, 
but definitely draft speaking notes and a 2013 joint statement, which is a joint statement that we have hundreds of organizations sign on to every year to talk about this issue. And all sorts of other documents can be emailed to you right away today if you register. And we also accept donations, of course, which is nwac.ca slash donations. We have the Grandmother Moon October 4th button, which is at the top in the center. Those are a dollar each. And we also have some fantastic uh, lapel pins which come with a commemorative keepsake paper inside. And those are $10 each. You can also make one-time donations, but we also offer products for the donations as well. So again, it's not too late to register for an October 4th Sisters and Spirit Vigil, especially consider holding a moment of silence at your workplace, your place of workshop, for example. And this is actually the link that you can go to to find out all the vigil locations in your area. So we're open for discussion now. Um, if, if we have, if Elvira wants to talk about uh, or show me some of the questions that people have been asking. <laughs> So thank you so much, Jennifer, for that uh, very rich and detailed presentation, and thanks for everyone um, for, for listening in, and I would like to invite people to submit their questions to the Q&A, um, through the Q&A panel, uh, really at, at any point. Um, there are some, some keen participants who have been following along and making comments uh, along the way, and a lot of people are really excited to, to find out more about where they can get information, uh, more information about the face, Faceless Dolls project. Maybe this would be a good moment to pull up the, um, the URL to your website. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that now. Uh, actually, I'm going to take back the, um, the role as presenter to make sure that everyone can see the URL to um, the Native Women's Association of Canada website. So that's up there on your screen. And Jennifer, do you want to point us to where we people would find information about the Faces Stall project? I believe it would be under the uh, You go under Department. Under and department. You go under Department. And then you'll see on the uh, left-hand side, the Evidence to Action. There's Faces Dolls. It's all in caps there. So you just go in through the departments, and the Community Resource Guide is there, the Faceless Doll Project. Um, it's under our project name, Evidence to Action. All of our work is there, and there's also uh, information there on the October 4th Sisters in Spirit movement, as well as the locations for 2013 and the registration form. So thank you very much for that, and, and um, I, I find th there was so much rich information. I, I mentally sort of summarized the different points that if people want to get involved, there's different ways for people to get involved. There's signing uh, the petition for uh, calling for a national inquiry. There's uh, either participating in, uh, in a vigil on, uh, vigil on Friday or organizing their own, and as you, you mentioned, there's still time to do that. Uh, there's also um, educational um, educational projects that, that people, uh, if so inclined, could, could participate in and, and organize uh, within their schools or in their communities. Or uh, it sounds like it's a super open project, the Face of Stalls project, and it could be, um, it, it could be done really anywhere in, in many, many different forms. You mentioned at the very beginning the, the resource guide, and that was more focused on violence prevention. I was wondering if you could um, just talk a little bit more about that. A lot, uh, I'll, I'm going to go back to the poll results so you can have a look at them. I don't know if you had a chance to look at them yet. Uh, hopefully you still see them on your screen. Just to get an idea of who's in the room, I, I know by looking at the list of participants that a lot are uh, who are listening in are girls programmers. And so let's say if a girls programmer who is Let's say working with uh, Aboriginal communities, or may or may not be working with Aboriginal communities, and wanted to actually use some of your resources. Can you give us just a really quick idea of some tips on on how those resources could be used in a let's say in a girls' club setting or in a community setting? Sure. Um, I'm I'm glad that people are picking up on the community resource guide. It's a great resource. It took years in the ma uh, making. Uh, originally, we were putting together specific toolkits that were just by subject, and that was you know things that we were seeing. If people needed these fact sheets or these type of toolkits, how do I engage? How do I host a vigil? How do I do this? And in 2010, we put them all into one resource. And I think if you're doing any type of girls club, one of the best ways to kind of get people engaged there is chapter three is for uh, educators. 
And in Chapter 3, there's a whole uh, series of vetted resources on great ways to kind of front load girls and students on this type of issue from videos to websites to really just show them uh, here is here's the issue that we're talking about. And it can deal from anything from racism to pre-contact history, contact history and, and doing that kind of work. So there are some great resources in there that's in Chapter 3 and it's called Resources. And we have another resource in there called How to Introduce This Issue, This Darker Issue of Missing and Murdered Aboriginal Women and Girls, This Extreme Violence into the classroom and talk to young girls about it. So those resources are in there. There are the fact sheets that I talked about. That's for, you know, girls and young women who are looking for the facts and, and doing this type of work already for a girls club or say they do uh, human rights work already. They have an amnesty chapter doing that kind of work. That would be great. And then there are some really kind of lessons learned in the, in the beginning chapters of the community resource guide about how to start it off and how to assess what your own group can do, you as an individual or a group or a team or organization, and what actually you want to do. Um, I can tell you quite honestly, sometimes engaging First Nation Métis Inuit communities and organizations can be a daunting task. And there are some points in there about how to approach an organization respectfully and also to be um, very open to calling and having an organization such as, such as myself or NWAC. I still get a lot of these calls where people are asking to help. And what I really need right now, for example, is volunteers to help me with the Ottawa rally that we organize every year. And sometimes people are looking for more. They're looking to do um, type of fundraising or do that type of work, but that's not the type of uh, help I need right now. And sometimes it's difficult for me just to let people know that even though they're keen, um, sometimes it only needs help in certain areas during the time of year. And uh, it's actually uh, a deterrent for me then to take these calls from people who are not willing to to say, well, this is how I need help, but they have their own ideas of how to help. I don't know exactly if I'm making sense in, in that way, but there are great toolkits in there about how to do that. There's a safety measures toolkit in there, too, about how to stay safe in your home and at work and when you're traveling and doing that kind of stuff as well. So there's loads and loads of work in the Community Resource Guide. Um, we have a call to action right now for this week, October 1st to 4th. So if some of you are interested, please um, friend us on Facebook. We have a profile called Sisters In. So that's one word, Sisters In, and the last name is Spirit. So Sisters In and Spirit is a last name. And if you friend us on Facebook, you'll be connected to our call to action, which has 10 things that you can do right now today to support October 4th Fist Vigils. And Alvira also talked about that. Number one, it's finding a vigil in your area and attending, holding a moment of silence. Number two, in your own workplace, school, or place of worship, or girls club. Number three, lighting the virtual candle. Number four, signing the petition and sharing that one as well that I talked about. Number five is learning about the Face of Doll project and um, thinking about how to make that commemorative part of, part, of, part of your own girls club. Number six is reading the life stories that I introduced and talking about it, and we'll be releasing three new digital life stories very soon. Number seven is learning about how you can support families and be an advocate, really, for this issue. And the best tool you can go to right now is the Community Resource Guide that we've already talked at length about. You could donate online to help NWAC continue their work. That's the eighth step. Number nine, of course, is writing Prime Minister Harper, your local member of parliament, MLA, councillor, or mayor, and telling them about this issue and, and demand action for it. And number 10, of course, the last one is to call your local newspaper and ask them to cover the October 4th vigils in your area. And after October 4th, you can write a letter to the editor and call your local newspaper and thank them for covering it. Or if they didn't cover it, also writing your displeasure about how they didn't cover it as well, even for, for me in Ottawa. It takes a lot of work for me to get the Ottawa media out to cover Aboriginal-specific events in the country. 
Um, thank you so much for for that, Jennifer. That's a, a lot, um, a lot of pieces and a, a lot of opportunities for individual and collective action. And there, there's someone who is attending who has a more specific question about again, if we're working directly with youth, how to talk about some of these issues. And she asks, um, I, I work with youth offering presentations on gender-based violence, and we're always working on drawing clear connections between colonial violence. violence and gender-based or other systems violence. Uh, she'd like to know, um, I'm wondering, how you frame co colonization in classrooms. So that's a really important question. Um, you talked about um, the resource guide. I'm wondering if you, if you can think of so something that might be in the resource guide or from your experience, anything you'd like to share on how to frame, frame the issue of col colonization in classrooms. Mm -hmm. It's great. Um, I really appreciate, Kingley, Kingley, that you're noting the difference between those two approaches because that is really important. Um, you'll see in the Chapter 3 section of the Community Resource Guide when you download it that we try not to make that distinction only because um, you're one of the only educators, uh, I could say a handful over the years that I worked with who um, recognize the difference and have the different approaches. A lot of the times when I have teachers and educators who are approaching me to talk about this issue, they're not looking at it through uh, a lens of colonial violence or a gender-based lens. And that's an issue, but we also um, don't want to uh, come from a place of judgment right before there. It's great that they're even talking about this issue and what they want to do. So we try and make it very much um, broad. It's, it's really, I think, up to the educator how they want to approach it. I have seen great success from other teachers and educators through the colonial violence lens and looking at that. One of the fact sheets that's in Chapter 3 is actually looking at the root causes of this violence and the impact of colonization. So if you're looking to go that route, the third fact sheet, which is the last fact sheet in the series in Chapter 3 of the Community Resource Guide, specifically talks about colonial violence in that perspective. If you're looking to approach it from a gender-based project, I think, uh, a gender-based lens, that can also be done very, very well. And we really kind of leave it up to the educator on how they, they want to approach it that way. OK, so that, that, that's great. And um, Kingsley actually has a, a follow-up question. And, and there's also another question coming up, so I, I want to make sure we have time for all the questions. Um, so Kingsley would also like to know about how to, how to involve boys and men in the conversation. Um, she points out that there's a, a large focus on, on educating girls and women, um, but what about boys and men? Are they engaged in this movement, and, and how, or should they be, and, and how to go about doing that? Yeah, that's a great question too, Kingsley. I'm really glad that there's uh, a lot of great questions going going on here. It's always really important to talk to men and boys about this. Now, we're the Native Women's Association of Canada. So right now, when we first started to do this work, and our, our documents right at the beginning now are focusing on from, from a gendered perspective. So Aboriginal women and girls, this type of violence. There is a toolkit. I believe it's in the first chapter of the Community Resource Guide which is about men as effective allies, and I think that's a really great um, resource to have, especially um, to give out to some of your um, the, 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 the male allies who are coming to join forces. I usually like to give that one in a very positive way, but to just let them know that this is the type of ally or partnership that we're looking for at the beginning. Um, that's great. There are also some other wonderful campaigns. There's the White Ribbon Campaign, the Ontario Federation of Indian Friendship Centers. So that acronym is uh, that's a long name, but the acronym is OFIFC. They have a wonderful, wonderful male and boy specific program called I Am a Kind Man. So you could look that up as well. I Am a Kind Man. If you just put that in quotes and search for it in Google, you would find it. It's a great Aboriginal specific resources to uh, look at that. And I also saw Kingsley just wrote the Moosehead uh, campaign. Uh, the Moosehide campaign is also great. There's a Bear Hide campaign as well. So these kind of ones getting boys and men to talk about this issue and their role in the violence is very important. Now the BC Lions, their football team in British Columbia, if you want to look for specific resources for men and boys, the BC Lions have a great program called Not, it's either 
don't be a bystander or not a bystander, something like that. But if you do BC Lions and bystander, you'll see it. And that's a great program as well where they bring boys together and they have sample scenarios. And there are no right or wrong answers, but the boys are encouraged to talk about how they would react if, say, they saw their friend in the hallway push their girlfriend into a locker, for example, and what he would do there. And they provide real dialogue and space for young boys to talk about this issue, which I really like, and it's a great program. And it's great to see football players and community uh, leaders come and bring boys together and talk about it. Thank you. I just put up... Um for everyone to see the names of the two campaigns that were mentioned, the Moose Hide campaign and the and the Bear Hide campaign. Um, so just for a moment, I'd like to go back to what you talked about. Uh, what you mentioned at the very beginning about the, the National Inquiry, and, and someone else is asking about that as well. They, they, they still want to really get a grapple of, of um, how uh, how to use the National Inquiry is her question. But maybe if you could speak a little bit about and you also mentioned during the, your presentation that um, the, the, the point of the National Inquiry is to actually, um, to, to instead of devaluing Aboriginal girls and women, to, to actually show how this is a Canadian issue. It's not um, solely a, a Native um, Native issue. It's not solely a women's issue. It is a Canadian issue. So what would that look like to make this a Canadian issue if we receive hopefully as many thousands of signatures as possible and this is pre presented to the federal government, what would the National Inquiry look like? Good question. Um, one of the main things first and foremost is that this is just a petition for call to show that Canadians are coming together to say that they're interested in this type of national in uh, public inquiry, which is really important, which would be separate from a task force, which would be separate from uh, the Opal inquiry that we saw in, in BC. Um, this kind of work we're talking about, a national public inquiry, much larger. It's part of the national action plan that Canada is responsible for putting out and a framework for addressing violence in this country, which I believe Canada has until 2015 to submit to the United Nations. So this is all tied into these type of, of steps. It's not for me right now as a, as a representative to talk about what exactly that inquiry would look like. This is just a first step to say that there's a national, there's national support for this type of inquiry and then we'll sit all together with families and communities and talk about exactly what this would look like in terms of the nuts and bolts. But it would be a, a long process. I think it would be something very similar to the Truth and Rec Reconciliation Commission talking about this type of issue. But um, that's what we're looking at right now. Just the first step is to show Prime Minister Harper as well as the federal government and provincial and territorial governments as a whole that there is support from Canadians from all walks of life to have a national public inquiry and then we'll start having a conversation of what exactly that's going to look like and we also have a lot of lessons learned from other countries who have done similar type of work and we have some task force and commissions that have also occurred here in Canada that have, um, have their own successes but also their failures as well so talking about that as well. The sort of um, big lines would be to look at, would it be to look at, well, why are there so many Virginia are missing Aboriginal women and girls in Canada, and you know, how is the justice system set up? How is it set up in such a way that, that they're not on the map, that it's the work of, the, of a national association to sort of put them on the map? Would these be some of the questions that would be raised? That would be some of it for sure definitely to talk about this in a, in a public setting. So, for example, some of the work has already been done by, by my organization, the Native Women's Association of Canada, and other academia and other organizations, but um, not in a, in a public way where we actually have uh, judges coming together and, and looking at this information and talking about why this happened, why this is happening. So the, sort of looking at it from a macro perspective to bring it back uh, a little bit to, to more of a, a micro uh, perspective, working directly in communities and, 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 
again, talking a little bit more about the education side of things, um, the Face of Stalls project um, looks just really wonderful, and and what really resonates um, someone who works at Girls Action Foundation is sort of that focus on resilience in voice, um, which is something that we also try to do uh, at Girls Action, and sort of um, taking something that is um, is incredibly that, that is a tragedy, and incredibly sad, and sort of um, still presenting it in, in a way to in a way that uh, that gives hope. And, and it gives people um, something concrete and, and a way to take action on the issue. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you, you also mentioned about how you adapt the language um, if you're working with, with, um, with younger children. Um, how would you approach this issue with, let's say, uh, a group of, of students who A, know nothing about the issue, perhaps haven't been touched by the issue, and and are very young and and have yet to be exposed to things like death, uh, let alone murder. Okay, um, it, I know it's a it big question. Really, no, it is. It's a, it's a big question. I've done it before um, to several younger audiences. I, that's one of the reasons why I like the Face of Doll project. So, for example, you saw the big shot of all the, the dolls for National Aboriginal Day. So on June 20th, which was the Friday before the, the Solstice Festival on National Aboriginal Day, we had uh, more than 3,000 students from the Ottawa and surrounding areas come for it's like Aboriginal awareness. And we had a huge tent with the dolls. And at the beginning, I brought all the kids up, and we looked at the dolls, and we were just asking questions. And I told them who I was and introduced myself as Métis and talked about being Métis and what that meant, and then we talked about the dolls, and um, you can go two ways. It depends on, on uh, the teacher as well, so depending on the classroom. I did have a chat with the teacher be beforehand. You can talk and focus solely on honoring Aboriginal women and girls, so adding that type of value, talking about Aboriginal women as strong, as beautiful, the resilience of voice that you were just talking about. That is fantastic language. That's what we want to see. We want to see that adding a value and talking about Aboriginal women, First Nation, Métis, Inuit women and girls in a positive way, in a positive light, you know, in a vibrant, bright way, which is what the dolls uh, are as well, you know, doing that kind of work. But you can talk to children about it to say, uh, you know, um, especially if you're talking about issues of fairness. I know that young children especially, they know the difference between right and wrong. They know the difference between fair and unfair. And we see that a lot with wonderful, successful campaigns uh, that Cindy Blackstock, for example, and the First Nation Child and Family Caring Society are doing. They do theirs on February 14th. That's called Have a Heart Day. And that's where they work with teachers and educators to talk about discrepancies be between First Nation education and access to education and funding compared to uh, the Canadian funding program, what we have right now, and that's a great way to do it. And that's kind of how I've learned to talk about it. We talk about missing women and talk about this type of injustice that I would go, for example, and talk about a specific doll and say this woman's daughter went missing and when she went to the police, they said that they weren't going to look for her daughter. Now, what does that mean to you? What 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 would how does that make you feel? Do you think you know? Then you have kids right away. They understand that's not fair. That's not how it's supposed to be. And then you can talk to them about racism and these types of issues that go on in our society. That not everyone is treated equally in this country. And for example, one of them is First Nation, Métis, Inuit women and girls are not treated equally when they're brought in uh, when well, by law enforcement and the justice system. So I've done it that way. Okay, those are really great ideas, and I'm keeping an eye on the time, and we have a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to to do a, a couple more things in these last couple of mis minutes. Um, in the mean, in the meantime, if anyone else has a question, please send it um, through the Q and A box. Um, we we did a poll um, earlier on, and we have another poll that we'd like to throw out just to to get a little bit of feedback uh, about. Your experience with a with a webinar session and just to, it gives us information on on how we're doing and how we could do better the um, the, the next time round. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna open the poll um, 
the next poll as well. And if, if uh, those who are still who are still attending the webinar can just take a couple of minutes to answer those questions as well. Um, I, I also wanted to put up a couple of links, uh, the link to the Girls Action Foundation website as well, um, where you can find out more information about upcoming webinars, um, as well as all of our social media handles. They're up on the screen. And, and while maybe people are taking the next couple of minutes just minutes to answer the polling questions. I wanted to ask you, Jennifer, if you can just share sort of uh, any concluding words on, for you, what would be the most important thing? If people were going to choose one thing to do, um, what would you like to, to call out for people to do? Um, one thing uh, always is um, you need to connect to this issue from, from, a, from a human level. And so my number one suggestion is to go on the NWAC website and look for the 2013 Sisters and Spirit Vigil locations nearest you and attend a vigil in your community or surrounding area and go and listen to your community members. Participate and let people know that you're there and you have heard about it because connecting to this issue in, on a human level is the most important. Again, to connect with us on Facebook, the Native Women's Association of Canada has its own page. We have our own profile. Again, it's Sisters In, one word, Sisters In, and the last name Spirit. So Sisters In is one word. And at Twitter, we're at NWAC, at N-W-A-C underscore comms, C-O-M-M-S. So it's at NWAC underscore comms. Okay, so Sisters In Spirit, I'm going to type it up here, Sisters In Spirit, all one word you said? No, it's Sisters In is the first name, and the last name is Spirit. They won't let you just have a one word profile name. So we had to split okay. it up to be the first name is Sisters In, and the last name is Spirit. Hopefully I wrote that correctly. <laughs> I put it up in the in the, in the chat panel. Yeah. Um, you could also, can, I'm, I'm sure that through the, uh, the nwac.ca uh, website, um, I'll just put that up for yeah, so a That's right. It's Sisters in Spirit. That's our Facebook profile, and our Twitter is at nwac hyphen uh, sorry underscore coms. So nwac underscore coms. C o m n c o m m s, and that's where you can go to. Uh, get more information and be connected, especially to this call of action that I was talking about, the 10 things you can do right now. But the number one is to learn about Sisters and Spirit Vigils and attend the one nearest you. Second would be, if you don't have one in your area, have one in your workplace. All it takes is a quick email to us saying you want to have a moment of silence and we'll send you some information and just marking and honoring a day. We have actually eight Sisters and Spirit Vigils going on in Ottawa alone on Friday. We have so many different workplaces and federal departments who are holding moments of silence, and that's the first time we've seen that this year, so we're really happy to see that as well. And for those of you who are participating um, in other provinces, or yes, who are on the line and are participating from other provinces, um, if you don't have one in your community, this is a good opportunity to start one. <laughs> And so I see that there's still a few more people that are finishing up the poll, and I forgot to mention that, of course, your answers are confidential, so feel free to to um, to, to answer in confidence. And uh, I would just like to thank you once again, Jennifer, for for saying yes to participating in, in today's uh, webinar and for giving such a rich uh, presentation on such an important issue and giving us so many resources. Um, where we can take action and just find out more about the issue as well. So thank well, you. Well, I, I really appreciate the invitation, and thank you. It's great to see so many participants online and and, and do this. It's a busy time of year, the busiest week that I have all year, but I'm happy to, to give up some time on October 1st before the ball really starts rolling here to talk with all of you, and hopefully I hear from you soon. Again, my name is Jennifer Lord, and my email is jlord, J-L-O-R-D, at nwac.ca. jlord at jlord at nwac.ca. Or you can always call the, the head office here in Ottawa and just ask to talk to me, but there are two Jennifers in the office, but we both work together, so either one of us could answer your questions as well. Thank you once again, and for, for the person who was asking about whether or not this is going to be available online, it will be available online as a podcast. Um, expect to receive it in your email box um, the next week or so. Uh, 